Okay, I want to read Philippians chapter 4 and verses 12 to 14. It's our scripture today with my message, The Times Demand Flexibility. In Philippians chapter 4 and verses 12 to 14, it states, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Let's have a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather here, and we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to preach your word again. We pray, Father, that you'll be with our nation, our country. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to get through this difficult time in our lives. Thank you that we can always depend upon you no matter what the circumstance, thank you, Lord Jesus, for our salvation. Thank you for our deliverance. In Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned before, the name of the message is the times demand flexibility. Mankind is set in their ways. The older you get, the more difficult it is to change. I'm not talking about change just for the sake of change, but a change for the better. To be able to do this, it takes flexibility. A little note here, if you are a planner, someone who knows what you want and to have a to-do list and feel a small rush of adrenaline when even small tasks are completed as expected, it is quite frustrating when life diverts your plans and sends you on a detour or other things change. As of the preaching of this message that was recorded the week of March 29th, the world is in an upheaval of a difficult circumstance. The coronavirus has affected all of us, possibly not from a sickness point of view, many of us are still healthy, but from all normal activities. It has hurt lives, families, loss of revenue, changes of plans, and for one third of Americans, we are self-quarantined the likes which we have never seen before in this great nation. What we need in this time is flexibility, to be able to go on with our lives and also to be able to thrive. Flexibility is a personality trait that describes the extent to which a person can cope with changes in circumstances and think about problems and tasks in novel and creative ways. When the unexpected arises, people need to be able to change their stance, outlook, or commitment to something. Flexibility is the ability to adapt to situational demands and to keep a balanced approach even in the most difficult circumstances. So my first point is this, and I'm going to be turning to John chapter 10 and verse 28. One thing that will never change is your salvation. One of my favorite verses, it says, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. This verse is a bedrock verse for the believer. I give unto you so that no one can take it away. Here you have the proof by a positive and a negative statement. <clears throat> the positive. I give unto you eternal life. The negative proof, you will never perish for all eternity. But it goes a little bit further than this. In verse 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. This eternal life is secured by the Father. 
This is not just a personal thing that I'm thinking up that maybe there is out there some heaven or eternal life. This is secured by the Father from the Word of God that we have a secure foundation of eternal life that will never end. My Father is greater than all. In the Greek, all is used to mean every kind or variety, everything, everyone, and any, anybody as well. This is extremely important because it also means you. Why owe you? Why is it that many people believe that we cannot lose our salvation unless we decide to undo the transaction? This word here, when it says all, it also refers to you that even if you wanted to, you could not and you cannot undo the transaction of salvation. Now that brings me to a good question. As a Christian who wants to undo the, uh, the trans, uh, transaction of salvation, I mean, it's all positive. I give unto you eternal life and you shall never perish. You are not strong enough to overcome what God has done for you. Total and complete salvation, 100%. This is unchangeable, undeniable, what Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary. This salvation must be asked for, and it is done only by trusting the Lord as Savior. So the question always arises, but how do we trust the Lord? Now, I realize that most of the people that go to our church have accepted Christ as Savior. And so as soon as I say, trust Christ, they understand all the components about trusting Christ. But people don't understand what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. How do you have a relationship with God who you have never seen? How do you have a personal relationship with the creator of this universe? So God has given us a real plan of salvation so that we have a step-by-step -step idea how we can accept Jesus Christ as our personal savior and have a relationship with the God of the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This tells us that salvation is not based on your works, but on faith. Grace, you are saved by faith. By faith, trust, adherence to, not of works, the opposite of trust. Your works set up boasting, but your faith points to Christ. So if I think that I can be saved by my works and by my deeds, the question is, how many deeds? How many works? What works? But if I'm saved by faith, it takes the works equation out of it. And it's just only on Jesus Christ. Now to illustrate this, I want to turn to the book of Luke. And it's a great little parable here. Luke chapter 18. And in Luke chapter 18, I'm looking at verses 9 to 14. So I'm going to read this whole parable first. And we're going to break it down a little bit so we can understand what it's about referring back to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And so in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. 
I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, made right, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Here is the great parable of the Pharisee, a picture of work salvation. Versus the tax collector. A tax collector was looked down upon. He was categorized as tax collectors and sinners. There was nothing worthy within himself. He knew he was a crook. He knew he was a cheat. And guess what? Everybody else knew the same thing as well. The tax collector. But in verse 13, a great verse, we have the whole plan of salvation laid out in a little tiny verse. And as I read it again, listen to it, please. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. In this verse, we find the complete plan of salvation. I can't save myself. And I recognize that I am a sinner. I repent of my sins. In other words, he said, I can't even look up into heaven. And he beat on his breast. In Gill's commentary, he puts it this way. But smote upon his breast, pointing at the fountain of his sin, expressing by his actions, his sorrow and repentance for it, an aversion and an abhorrence of himself on account of it, joined with indignation and revenge, and he did this to arouse and stir up all the powers and faculties of his soul to call on God. Lord, I can't save myself. Lord, I am helpless. I am hopeless. Lord, you are my salvation. But the tax collector did not stop there. He realized how abased he was. But then he asked the Lord to save his very soul. He said, be merciful to me, O Lord. You only have salvation. <clears throat> I will completely trust in you for my salvation 100%. You cannot combine faith and works. You either believe that works can help you or you know that faith can help you. The Pharisee believed that works could help him and it was pointless and useless. For the Lord himself said that the tax collector went home saved and justified a believer. But the self-righteous Pharisee, who was a good person, who did everything right, who people respected, he did not walk away justified. He was called self-righteous. In verse 14, I tell you this, man went down to his house justified, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee. And the whole idea of salvation is humility. For everyone who exalts himself, exalts himself like the Pharisee, will be humbled. And he who humbles himself, like the tax collector, will be exalted. Number two, life is ever-changing. I'm going to take a very, very familiar passage here. And it is Psalm 23. David, when he wrote this psalm, had so many difficulties in his life. And, of course, David was a shepherd boy. And we have a counterpart of this psalm in John chapter 10 with the sheep. But I want to look at some of these verses here in Psalm 23. And, of course, familiar psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to 
lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is probably one of the most frequently quoted scriptures ever, especially during a funeral or a difficult time. It is a great psalm. Even people that do not know the Bible usually recognize the Lord's psalm. Great set of Bible verses. But let's look at verse 1 here. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. Here is the definitive declaration. The Lord is my shepherd, my salvation. I shall not want anything more. I shall not want anything more whatsoever. This is the unchangeable part of our life. My salvation is safe and secure. Just as we said in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, just as we said there in Luke chapter 18 with the tax collector, just as we said in John chapter 10, verse 28, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Just because things are difficult today in the world, not just in America, but it's a pandemic, just because of that, it doesn't change the fact that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Verses 2 and 3. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. In other words, he gives me comfort in any situation and under any circumstance. I'm able to be sustained. I'm able to be sustained by the Lord. And he is my provision. He is my guide. Therefore, he is the one who leads. I put my decisions into his hands. Why are these things happening? Because of sin. There would be no killer virus without sin. There'd be no death without sin. Why didn't the Lord do something about it? He is doing something about it. He paid for your sin price on the cross of Calvary to give you salvation, to give you everlasting life. He is there for you. But he wants us to depend upon him. And that's where the matter of flexibility comes in. How flexible are we to be able to follow the edicts of the Lord, but yet also to adhere to what our governor says, our president says? We have to be flexible. Travel is almost non-existent today. Most of you are at home. As we mentioned, a third of Americans are in self-quarantine because of the coronavirus that we have. But yes, yet God did not leave us alone. That he still comforts us. In verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The valley of the shadow of death. Though I am in peril of death, though in the midst of dangers, deep as a valley, dark as a, shower, a shadow, and dreadful as death itself, I will not fear. Why? Because you are with me. When the changeable comes, my trust is stayed upon the rock, Jesus Christ. That has to be our rock, our certainty, Jesus Christ. Because of our salvation, in life or death, we are the Lord's. Romans chapter 14, verse 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord. 
And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. This is what salvation does for us. He protects us, yes, <coughs> while we're living, but yes, he keeps us, yes, while we go to be with him in heaven. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. That is a tremendous blessing to us. It says, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. We are in ever-changing times, dangerous times, especially we who fit into the most vulnerable to this unforgiving disease. So let's say, uh, let, let's see here. They say, if you're a male, you're more likely to contract it. If you're 70 and above, you're more likely to have problems with it. If you have lung problems or other problems, you have more of a chance of not surviving it. So I was talking to Charlene the other day and I said, every, every one of these uh, instances that they've given me, I fit in all the categories. Matter of fact, so bad, there's even a little thing out there, we don't know if it's true or not, but it says, for instance, if you have type A blood, you're more uh, really susceptible to the disease. I have type A blood. I mean, 100%. But you know what? My trust is in the Lord. It's not in things. That is the most important thing. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Here is the shepherd's care. Great care that we have. The rod is pastoral care. And the staff, the defense and protection afforded by and for the sheep. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Even in difficult times, the Lord sustains us because of his great grace. The Lord never leaves us nor forsakes us, especially in times of trouble. And then the last verse here in verse 20, uh, chapter 23, it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Times may change, but the Lord doesn't. The Lord gives us trials to go through, so that we can more rely upon him and not ourselves. When it comes down to sickness or comes down to that moment of death, it's only between you and the Lord, and that is it. Number three, I'm going to be turning to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Number three, flexibility is the key to spiritual growth. Flexibility is the key to spiritual growth. So in chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, with Abraham, before his name was changed, they called him Abram. God changed his name to Abraham as a father of a great nation. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of the country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you a great name and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Things are a lot easier for younger men, young people. The strength, the stamina, the dreams, the excitement. But this command was not given to a younger person this command was given to one who is 75 years old. 75 years old. Little note here, God never works the way you expect him to work. He never does. Maybe God has a sense of humor. I guess he does. I always said that if he saved Ron Mahood, he can save anybody, and he must have had a sense of humor. But I want to look at this a little bit further here, please. 
And I'm going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 9. So the unexpected, how does God work? Now we know, of course, that he developed the nation of Israel from Abraham. And Israel was the apple of his eye, still the apple of his eye. He loves the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation was set up just so that we could have Messiah come from Abraham's loins. So here we have a time in history, and we have an evil king of Israel, Jehoram, and we have a godly king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And in 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah, and the king of Edom. And they marched on that roundabout route seven days. And there was no water for the army, nor for the animals that followed them. So here we had actually three kings coming together. And it was the king of Eden, the king of Judah, and the king of Israel. Misha, king of Moab was paying tribute to, the, to Israel under King Ahab, the most evil king that Israel ever had. <coughs> but when Ahab died, his son, Jehoram, not a good guy. He was not a strong king. So Misha knew that Ahab's son, Jehoram, was weak, and he rebelled against Israel. When you pay tribute to someone, it's because they have defeated you and you're actually paying a tax to them because you lost. That's what tribute is. So Misha thought, it's my opportunity to get out of this thing. So this is very important here. So in verses 7 and 8, it reads, Then he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. That's what Jehoram is saying. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Then he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, by way of the wilderness of Edom. So Jehoram came to king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, and asked for help. Now remember, Jehoram was an evil man just like his father. However, Judah and Israel had one thing in common. They're Jewish. Yes, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel had problems with the two tribes of Judah. However, they were still Jewish. Now, interesting Bible verses here. Verses 11 to 12. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? You see, Jehoshaphat knew that God was his savior. He knew that God could be his victor. And he said, I am not used to Israel here. I know Judah and our prophets. Is there any prophets around here that are straight shooters that work for the Lord and not for themselves. Verse 12. Or let me finish verse 11. So one of his servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Eden went down to him. Elisha, what a man. Verse 14. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand surely, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. In other words, Elisha says, to Jehoram, the only reason why I'm going to help out 
and give victory to the nation of Israel and Judah is because of the godly king Jehoshaphat. Wow, what a blessing that is, isn't it? So here's the edict. Now, we made this statement before, and we said that God never works the way you expect him to work. <coughs> He's done this through my life different ways as well, and probably your lives as well. So here's the edict. This is what Elisha says. And he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, Yet that valley shall be filled with water so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. In other words, Elisha says, don't go around them. Don't try to defeat them with the enemy, uh, with, the, with your, your military prowess. Make sure you just go in and simply dig ditches. So don't do it with the spear. Don't do it with the bow. Do it with the shovel. So can you imagine, all of a sudden, Jehoshaphat says, listen, Elisha says it, let's do it. And Jehoram is probably saying, what is this guy doing anyway? Okay, let's do it. And the king of Eden says, okay, let's do it. And all the men there are digging little ditches. What does that have to do about fighting the enemy? The whole thing is this, God wants the victory. Could Israel be flexible enough to do something that goes against the grain to dig ditches? This is such a remarkable event that there is no way that Israel, Edom, and Judah could claim victory by digging ditches. Verses 21 to 24. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to bear arms and older were gathered, and they stood at the border. Then they rose up early in the morning, and the sun was shining on the water. First of all, it didn't rain. So they didn't expect water to be in the ditches. It was a God thing. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side, and because of the reflection, it says, as red as blood, it looked like blood, not water. And they said, this is blood. The king surely struck swords and have killed one another. Now therefore, Moab to the spoils. So they assumed that Jehoshaphat was fighting Jehoram, and Jehoram was fighting the king of Edom, and they killed each other, and now they're just going to go down and take all the spoils and steal everything. So when they came to the camp of Israel, Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites so that they fled before them and they entered their land, killing the Moabites. Wow. What an unconventional way to get victory. So let's go back to Abraham here for a second. In verses 4 to 6 in chapter 12. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the Tebarinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Friends, Abraham was old, 75 years old. Abraham was childless. If you're 75 years old, I don't think you're going to have any kids. I think it's a little late. Abraham was wealthy. Well, you know yourselves. If you didn't have any kids, you'd have a lot more money. That's the fact. Kids are expensive. Yes, kids are a blessing. We have a selfish generation today. They don't want to have kids, many of the people in our country. I think it's selfishness. 
because they want to keep the money. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to raise a child. Abraham probably wanted children. However, he couldn't have any children. His wife was barren Sarai. But Abraham was faithful. 100%. So a question arises. Did everything work out perfectly for Abraham as he followed the Lord? And the answer, of course, is no. His own ideas and flesh got in his way. We know the stories where Abraham failed. But through the tough times and the difficult circumstances, he learned the matter of faith and trust. And so must we as well in the time of flexibility. We have to learn these things. And then number four. The times demand flexibility. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. We read the scripture in the very beginning. Great, great scripture. Chapter 4 and verses 11 and 12. Not that I have speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am, Paul is saying, to be content. Whoa, to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Rigidity is not the mark of a strong Christian because most of our stands are based on self and not the Lord. We might call that stubbornness. Your flexibility in life should never compromise your testimony. So we're not talking about being flexible with doctrine and flexible with the word of God, flexible with your belief. We're not doing that. Your flexibility in life should never compromise your testimony. Flexibility needs to deal with situations and how we face ever-changing things in life that are thrown at us. Paul was the most rigid Individual in his faith and doctrine. He never compromised his testimony. We should also never compromise our testimony. But how we face difficulties and problems that are thrown into our lives, that's where we need to be flexible. Verse 12. I know how to be a base. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I know how to abound. I know how to be a base. Being a base means to know how to get through difficult circumstances. So a question is this. Do you let circumstances control you Or are you in control of the circumstances? There is a saying, all sun makes a desert. All of us want the good things in life, but let's face it, the bad comes along with the good. You have to have some rain in your life. Now, we don't want you to have a flood, obviously. Paul goes on to say, I know how to be full and hungry. Have you ever really been hungry before? I don't mean missing a meal. I mean really being hungry. So just a little personal story here. I was in college. I was a, let's see, I was a senior in college in Houston, Texas, Houston Baptist University. (laughs) And I decided I didn't want to live in the dorm, you know, used to get room and uh, board and everything. So I had a friend, Ricky Jones, and Ricky had a trailer. And he says, Ron, you can pay a lot less, and I'll provide the food and provide the housing and everything. I said, Ricky, sounds great. Let's do it. The problem was, Ricky had to go out of town. And Ricky left me with no food. And another problem was, I ran out of money. So... I didn't have any food. 
So this time of my life was a very difficult time. I did not eat for five days. And I will tell you, when this happens, after a while, you just don't even get hungry anymore because you're just not used to it. I would just drink water or something like that. Had no money. Now, believe me, today it probably wouldn't happen. We have ATMs and, and kids have credit cards. In those days, you didn't get a credit card unless you owned a house. And a kid, a college kid, was not going to have uh, a credit card. You could not qualify for one. And besides that, when I let my dad know that I didn't have any money, he sent me a check, but it was by slow mail. He didn't do anything by Western Union, but uh, uh, the whole thing was, for five days, I did not eat. I immediately thought of what Paul said in Philippians, that there is a time of fullness and a time of emptiness. But I have to say this. That occurrence in my life probably taught me more than anything ever taught me before because I had to rely upon the Lord and I also realized that I could do things that I didn't think I could do. And it all is summed up in this verse. Verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My strength comes from Christ. Not my strength, but his strength. He gives me the ability to be flexible in any circumstance. So as I close here, just look at seven things here and about being flexible. Number one, we don't know the future, but we know who holds the future. Number two, we don't know how long this virus is going to continue to infect and destroy our lives. Number three, we don't know how long the economy is going to be closed down. Number four, we don't know if businesses will ever rebound from this tragedy. Probably many will, but some will close. Number five, some of you are struggling financially. Number six, some of you have lost great sums of money in retirement. And number seven, some of you can't get out because you're in a high-risk group. We need flexibility to be able to rely on the Lord. There is no time for discouragement. This is only a time for action and dependence upon the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, we gave you the plan in detail earlier. It's not about you, it's about him. It's not about your works, it's about what Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary. But I also want to talk to those people that have trusted Christ but maybe you have gone away a little bit from being dedicated and you have taken your eyes off of the Lord and you've put your eyes on self or on a problem. Remember, the Lord who made heaven and earth, the Lord who created you, has the answers for everything, all he wants is for us to rely upon him. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to preach your word again. We pray, Father, that you will help us through this difficult time. And as preaching this message, things are still in an upheaval. But Father, we know and we rely and we pray and ask you that you will deliver us. But Lord, we ask you for a special thing, that through this time, Countless scores of people will realize that they cannot do this themselves, but they have to rely upon you and that they will trust you as personal Savior. And for the believer that they will be dedicated to realize that you 
have their best interest at heart because you, who holds the future, know, Father, that we need to depend upon you. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to preach once again. In Jesus' name, amen.